This is CBC Vancouver News. We will have better and longer hours of service so people aren't bypassed uh, on full buses. Tonight on CBC Vancouver News, the province pledges more money for Metro Vancouver Transit, but mayors wonder where Ottawa's support is. I'm disappointed that the federal government continues to be absent from supporting our region's needs. Plus, there was a mixed anticipation about the uh, credit because the government has let the disabled community down so often. Disability advocates in BC are not impressed with the new federal benefit meant to start next summer. And Kamloops honors a fallen pilot with a new memorial near its airport. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Zara Premji. Residents of the North Okanagan community of Lumbee are afraid for their safety after the death of a woman earlier this week. The RCMP initially reported the woman as missing after an alleged attempted abduction. But now, after her death, police are saying very little about the case. The CBC's Brady Strachan has the latest on the ongoing investigation. There's a sense of grief, frustration and concern in Lumbee this week. In the town of 2,000 people where everyone knows everyone, the suspicious death of a mother here has shocked the community. The RCMP initially alerted the community about a missing persons case. Police say 44-year-old Tatiana Stefanski was allegedly seen speaking with her ex-husband and getting into his vehicle. Then, days later, police announced the discovery of a woman's body in a remote location during their investigation into her disappearance. And that a suspect was arrested but then released from custody on mandatory conditions. Today, police confirmed Stefanski is the victim. In Facebook posts made by individuals identifying themselves as Stefanski's boyfriend and daughter, she was described as an amazing mother. The family members asked for privacy as they mourn her loss. The local school district says Stefanski has children in the school system and schools in Lumbee are taking extra security precautions, keeping doors locked as the police investigation unfolds. As an abundance of caution for the circumstances that the entire community is facing, we just thought we'd let families know that we would wrap around their kids, offer some counselling services, um, have one direction in and out so that we kind of knew what was going on. Meanwhile, there are unanswered questions about the police investigation and the suspect. Mayor Kevin Acton says everyone in the community is on edge. You know, and I'm really concerned for our community because, of course, everybody, when you feel vulnerable like that, there's groups that are sort of starting to solidify if I inform, uh, I thought I think I saw something started today that's a justice for Tatiana, and you know we don't want uh, people going out and doing things themselves. We want to make sure that the police are given the room to do the job they need to do. He says people in Lumbee are grieving and at the same time concerned about their safety. The RCMP are saying very little about this case. The suspect in the missing persons investigation is now a potential suspect in this case as well. Police say the man was released on mandatory conditions to abide by, and that has many people in the community here feeling concerned. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Lumbee. Well, some good news for transit users across Metro Vancouver. The B.C. government says it's handing TransLink hundreds of millions more dollars to buy more buses and expand service. But as Mira Baines reports, some local mayors are angry Ottawa has not stepped in the federal budget. Transportation Minister Rob Fleming says TransLink users will see improvements to the Lower Mainland's bus service in the fall. We will have better and longer hours of service so people aren't bypassed uh, on full buses, uh, especially south of the Fraser. We have better and longer uh, hours of sea bus service so people can get back and forth to the North Shore more efficiently. The $300 million in provincial funding will also go towards the purchase of more buses. It can't come soon enough. The frequency of the buses in Surrey specifically are really poor. Um, sometimes you're waiting more than 30, 45 up to an hour. I wish we had more trains. I'm really glad that they're building the Broadway line, although I wish it would go all the way to UBC. The mayor of Port Coquitlam and chair of the Mayor's Council thanked the province, but was critical of Ottawa for not providing new funding now to support the region's transit. It is obvious that so much of the demand being placed on our transit system is from the decisions that the federal government has made with respect to population growth and immigration. 
Starting in 2026, the federal government's Permanent Public Transit Fund will inject $3 billion per year into transit. TransLink CEO wants that date to be moved up. What we've been advocating for is to accelerate that funding uh, to implement that in 2024, right? To bring it forward two years. While the federal budget invests $8.5 billion in new spending for housing, there are questions over why transit isn't getting more. The newcomers that they are inviting to Canada, the homes they are asking us to build, must be met with deeper transit investments. TransLink CEO Kevin Quinn said the federal government has committed $1.3 billion to the new Surrey-Langley SkyTrain project, but more infrastructure money is needed. Neera Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. A BC Review Board hearing for a man who killed his three children ended abruptly today after the man's lawyer quit. Alan Schoenborn has been held here at the Forensic Psychiatric Hospital in Coquitlam since 2010 after he was found not criminally responsible for the killings. The hearing was going to determine whether he should remain in treatment or receive a conditional or full discharge. But it was adjourned after Schoenborn started shouting at the hearing panel over some of their questions. His lawyer said they could not continue with the case. A family friend of the children's mother spoke to the early edition before today's hearing. And Alan Schoenborn has shown little progress over 15 years of being a patient. He still has anger issues. He has no supports in the community. His family is all but estranged. So for him to be released without the proper care and supports is mm -hmm. going to lead to further tragedy. And, and the family is just heartbroken by that possibility. During his trial, the court was told Schoenborn was experiencing psychosis at the time he killed his children and believed he was saving them from sexual and physical abuse. Two years ago, Schoenborn was granted unescorted leave from the hospital for a period of up to 28 days. When Coquitlam RCMP began searching the Fraser River for a stolen vehicle recently, they got more than they bargained for. Three additional submerged vehicles, including a school bus, were also discovered. So far, a black Honda Civic stolen in 2010 has been extra extracted from the river. The Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy has now assumed responsibility of the vehicle recovery due to the potential of environmental concerns. Chilliwack RCMP say they have seized large amounts of illicit drugs, guns and cash after carrying out several coordinated search warrants. Mounties searched various locations in Chilliwack, Vancouver, Surrey and Langley. They say they seized over half a million dollars in Canadian currency, almost 50 kilograms of suspected drugs and numerous guns. They arrested seven people who have since been released. To Kamloops now, where crews are working to install a memorial art piece at a new park near the airport. It's to honour a fallen pilot. Nearly four years ago, a bird strike caused a snowbird jet to crash. Royal Canadian Air Force Captain Jennifer Casey was killed. The new Meishi Soar monument, created by artist Sarah Holliday, features a plane made of a mosaic of maple leaves and branches held up by three pillars. The city of Kamloops says a new Fulton Field Park is expected to fully open later this year. Local advocates for people living with disabilities say they're disappointed with the federal budget. They say it does not provide enough for those struggling to get by. Sarab Sandhu has more on their concerns about a new benefit. Heather McCann is a disability advocate based out of Vancouver. Tuesday's federal budget announcement has not come as a surprise to them. The government has let the disabled community down so often. A new benefit for those living with a disability and low income will provide them an additional $200 per month, with payments set to begin rolling out in July of next year. When you're given $1,300, which is less than half of what one month's average rent is in Vancouver, you're already struggling to house yourself, feed yourself, clothe yourself. You add the disability and it's all the harder. The budget has allocated $6.1 billion over six years towards the new disability benefit. The announcement comes on back of the legislation passed last year to introduce a new national benefit meant to lift people out of poverty by topping up provincial support funding. I, I'm not quite sure what happened there because that is not lifting disabled people out of poverty. 
Advocates say Tuesday's announcement is a reminder that more community representation is required at the decision-making level. We need that leadership from within our community to not only be active, because lots of disabled people were active with this, it's the government to actually listen to what we are saying, as well as to prioritize disabled people. But we intend to keep telling our stories because our stories as disabled people are simply unforgettable. According to the advocacy group Disability with Poverty, about 1.6 million Canadians with disabilities are living below the poverty line. But not everyone qualifies for the benefit. And Tuesday's budget says only 600,000 will be covered. Saurabh so Sandhu, CBC News, Vancouver. They use the word practice, but it's pretty serious stuff, that, uh, this training session. It's, uh, it's very serious. As we brace for, what, brace rather for what's expected to be a busy wildfire season ahead, a local company is hustling to train aerial firefighters. Stick with us. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. Well, it's been 60 years since the first Ford Mustang went into production. The, own, the honor, to honor rather the milestone, hundreds of Mustang owners gathered at the Essex engine plant, the home of the five liter V8 engine. CBC Windsor was at the pony car party. We're celebrating Mustang's 60th birthday today. Look at all the people that are here to celebrate the iconic brand. It's amazing to see. We have 1964 Mustang over here. We got 2024s back here. Last count, we're over, we're over 200. And I think we have every generation of Mustang represented today. 60 years. It's an iconic brand. It's, it's, it's really much part of pop culture. I'm leaning on my 66 uh, Pony Edition convertible Mustang. This is an all original car, it's a, it's a survivor. And that's what I love about it, it's, uh, it, it was, it's just my, my, it's my baby. Do you have a pet name for it? No, no, my wife does though. <laughs> she calls it my girlfriend. It's, it's the V8 engine, right, which is what we make here at Essex Engine Plant. The engine in this car was produced at Windsor Engine Plant. So Windsor's got a, a long-standing history of making high-quality V8 engines. It's a 1967 Mustang. I was 17, it was my first car. I've uh, restored it twice. I've owned it since high school. And uh, I took all three of my daughters home from the hospital in this car. We're from a Ford family. Uh, my son has a Mustang. My grandson has a Mustang. We have a Mustang. And people just love the sound of the Mustangs when they go down. They're very muscle car. So when you think of Mustang, you think of power and you think of fast.
As BC's wildfire season begins, more people are being trained to fight fires on the ground and in the air. CBC's Ian Hanneman Singh got a unique glimpse into aerial firefighting. That uh, fire guard 124 has a system. Fire guard 124, Roger. This is 800 feet target altitude. So this would be the altitude that they would be at above the tree. Now dropping, you've got train off your right side, so you've got to watch out for that train there. We're watching pilots practice what they'll soon be doing for real for months, an air assault on a wildfire. I can't believe how low he is. Bullseye, you are going to come around. We'll likely see a lot of video of aerial firefighting this summer, but what happens here is a less well-known story. This is the headquarters of Con Air, just outside of Vancouver in Abbotsford, British Columbia. They have a fleet of more than 70 aircraft, more than 90 pilots, and they're giving us an inside look at how they're getting ready for fire season. We're headed to Harrison Lake, a short flight from Abbotsford. Ryan Gahan is going to show us a training mission. He's Conair's fleet manager of air attack operations. Everything that we do over fire will go on practice. They use the word practice, but it's pretty serious stuff that uh, this training session. It's uh, very serious. It is a gorgeous day for flying, but keep in mind when these pilots do this for real, the conditions will almost certainly be jarringly more challenging. Depending on how intense the, uh, the fire is, it kicks off a lot of energy and does create uh, uh, interesting uh, weather patterns and can adjust the winds. Let's take you behind the aerial choreography. The lead plane is called the bird dog. On board beside the pilot, there's an air attack officer, an expert on fighting fires. They would take a closer look at a fire and identify the precise target for the tanker. The bird dog pilot then flies the best approach and releases smoke to show the tanker pilot where that target is. And then you can see the bird dog is behind the tanker. Now right. the bird dog is checking the tanker's line. Right, he's helping direct it if needed. Helping direct if needed. They usually drop around 100 feet above the canopy. Because you don't want to drop too low because you, you want the water to lose, the drop to lose all that forward momentum. But if you drop too high, then the load will start blowing apart and you don't get the accuracy that you're, uh, that you're looking for. Where does a pilot learn all this stuff? We teach him. Before Con Air can teach you to fight fires, you need to be an experienced pilot. Around three to 4,000 hours of flight time. I'm kind of surprised at how many simulators you have. This is Con Air's Simulation Training and Tactics Center. A fleet of simulators can be linked together the way these pilots will have to coordinate their firefighting flights this summer. Six, eight, seven, we're fire engine tower. Scott Stewart, the manager of Flight Standards, is letting me take the yoke. I'll try not to have a big smile on my face here. Well, you should have a big <laughs> smile on your face. This is fun. You are airborne. So here we go. We've got a fire top of a ridge. Looks like it's burning south to north. On this day, the team is taking on a simulated wildfire near Kamloops in BC's interior. Uh, Retardant is dropped just ahead of the fire to slow it down. Ground crews can then go in and try to contain the fire. So we never want to go into something where we have to, uh, we don't have a planned escape maneuver. Mm -hmm. So I would never go at a fire like this, this direction, just because you've got hills and everything behind you. And here you're really, you're not dealing with flying technique, you're dealing with firefighting technique, right? That, yes, yeah. mostly firefighting technique, however, there is some flying technique. But the biggest thing is to be very predictable for everybody. Yeah. So we'll just do a little bit of a right turn and widen out okay. a bit from the mountain. Clients like the province of British Columbia rely on Conair and other companies during the wildfire season. BC says on average it runs about 560 missions with tankers every year. But the season's getting longer, more intense, and the need for aircraft is increasing. 
This is Hangar 2, where they convert passenger planes into air tankers. They used to do one a year here, now it's up to five, and that's not keeping up with demand. They're transforming a Dash 8 400 airliner into an air tanker. Conair points out this is a very Canadian operation. The plane, built by de Havilland, with engines from Pratt & Whitney, Canada. Jeff Barry is the VP of Business yeah. Development. We can work off 5,000 feet, but we can also fly at 360 knots, and we can draw long lines of retardant supporting those folks on the ground. So it, it really becomes a, a great fit for almost every aerial firefighting need in the, in the world. The Dash 8 400 is currently not in production, so Conair searches the world for them. Like from Britain's Flyby Airlines, which went out of business just over a year ago. The cabins are stripped of seats, a tank is attached, which can carry 10,000 litres of retardant. The same things that make Dash 8s attractive to airlines, powerful, versatile planes which don't need long runways to land, make them perfect for fighting fires, too. Renee Sanch has been flying for 11 seasons with Con Air, and he loves being at the controls of the Dash 8 400. You've flown a lot of planes. I have. Do you like this one? I love it. It's got lots of power. It's not an easy aircraft to fly. Um, it's fast. It's really fast. It's a sports car. The pilots here say aerial firefighting is not for everyone. During fire season, the hours are long and intense. Oh, you can feel the heat. The stakes are high, but so's the reward. Sanj says after the Fort McMurray fire eight years ago, he was hooked. We were protecting the highway because it was the only southbound route to get out of Fort McMurray. And we we're dropping uh, retardant and water right along the highway. The biggest reason I remember it is everybody got out of Fort McMurray and they evacuated 80,000 people and there was no deaths, there's no injuries. And you played a role in that. I did. The fact that all those people got out safely yes. is due in part to what you and other pilots did. Yes. Next week, Sanj and another pilot will be flying their planes to Alberta, joining two others which are already there. The company says it's the earliest deployment they've ever had for a long-term contractor. Everyone is getting ready for what's expected to be a longer fire season. All right, here's a live shot of the Georgia Viaduct and Science World. Darius will have your full forecast next. I was legally blind in one eye and had significant impairment in the other. In 2022, I was diagnosed with cataracts in both eyes. I was pressured into purchasing a special laser eye measurement and toric intraocular lenses and told that I would not have to wear glasses if I paid for those services. These patients say they were referred to private clinics to get their cataract surgeries done faster, and they were, but they also feel they were upsold. There was a hard sell on the laser surgery as the only one that would restore my sight. Pressured? What was clear to me was that if I declined to pay the fee they were charging, they would not provide me with their superior equipment. And duped. I paid $2,450. That wasn't at all necessary since I now have to wear distance glasses for watching television and, and so on. And I still need close-up glasses if I want to read a book. All medically needed cataract surgery is covered. If you're being told anything else in a private clinic, that is not the truth. The Ford government is planning to expand private for-profit clinics that do hips, knees and diagnostics. What we're trying to do is cut down on, on wait times. At Queen's Park today, Sylvia Jones was asked about the Health Coalition's concerns. We're talking about a group that is ideologically opposed to any innovation, any changes in the healthcare system. This can happen in a hospital, in a dentist's office, in a, in a clinician's office. So we have that process in place right now, and the numbers show it is a very, very small group that have to have that investigation, ultimately get reimbursed when appropriate. And they charged me $190 for the lens for one eye and $575 for the lens in the eye with astigmatism. These patients aren't expecting their money back. Can you just tell them how much you paid? It was $8,000. $8,000.
but they are at least expecting better oversight of private health care. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On May 9th, join CBC Vancouver's Dan Burrett at the Surrey Board of Trade's Top 25 Under 25 Awards, celebrating the incredible initiatives of Surrey's youth. And CBC Vancouver is the exclusive media partner of the DOXA Documentary Film Festival, May 2nd at 12th. Enjoy thoughtful and engaging documentaries, special presentations, and industry events. For festival information, visit doxafestival.ca. The weather update is brought to you by Direct Buy Furnace. To cool and clean the air in your home, call Direct Buy Furnace. Installing Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. All right, let's take a look at what's happening in the wonderful world of weather with Darius Madavi. Darius, sunshine, rain, I'm okay with anything at this point. Just give me some good weather. Oh, we get a little bit of both. Uh, your rain is coming faster and faster Saturday, probably mostly overnight, but probably in the evening as well. Uh, we'll see that rain. But right now we have this high pressure system sitting over the province. That low pressure is going to be what will bring us that system once this blocking ridge gets out of the way. So we're going to watch that continue to move east, making sure that we stay sunny and dry over the next few days. Uh, not too warm, maybe a couple degrees above seasonal on the coast, a couple degrees below seasonal in the interior. Uh, but then coming up, uh, coming down a little bit on the coast on Saturday as we see those, uh, we see that system move in and up in the interior. So a little bit of, uh, a little bit of, really depends where you are, what's going to happen. Now, this high pressure system is going to start moving south not too long away Saturday. And then you can see that low pressure swoops in, bringing that system, guiding it on shore Saturday, and then moving off again on Sunday. So that trough moves away again. So no more precipitation uh, after Saturday, it looks like. Hopefully for anybody who's doing, uh, you know, the sun run or wants to be outside on Sunday doing any activities. Uh, now, in terms of the cloud, you can see that staying away from the province because of that high pressure ridge. But then as soon as the low pressure moves in, we see that cloud come in. As soon as that ridge isn't blocking anymore, we see that rain swoop in early Saturday, uh, on sort of mid-afternoon Saturday, more than likely. Um, really depends. We will have a better idea probably uh, tomorrow when exactly that rain will arrive. But right now, it looks like mid-afternoon for most of the coast. Um, a little bit earlier for some parts of the island on the west coast. But as we look at temperatures today, fairly calm, fairly seasonal in most places. A little bit below in parts of the interior, uh, southern interior especially. Coming up tomorrow, coming up Friday, and then continuing to come up in the interior Saturday, but coming back down on the coast, but just briefly should start to come up again as we get into next week. In terms of conditions, nothing but sunshine tomorrow, a little bit of cloud lingering in the southeast, but that should clear out by the afternoon as well. In terms of a five-day forecast, we've got lots of sun on the way, day of rain, and then more sun after. All right, I'll take that day of rain. Thanks so much, Darius. Thank you. And that's your late news for Wednesday. Now, before you let that head hit the pillow, take one last scroll at cbc.ca slash bc to see what else is making headlines. Thanks so much for being here with us and have a fantastic night.